Thank you, Diana. So as Diana said, my name is Shannon Earhart, and I do work for Ten and the Chiefs, and we do partner with Denakanaga and the Morris Thompson uh, Cultural Center to, to do cultural programming here. And so we've been planning for about a year during COVID when we shut down our cultural programs over here at Morris Thompson, and we met with the partners to try to decide how we were gonna keep our cultural programming going during COVID. And one of the ways that we came up with an idea was to come up with um, Our People Speaks. And so it's been an interesting process for us, learning process, and so we're, I'm really excited actually to be here and to have a live audience to introduce our esteemed guests. But before I quite get there, I wanna introduce myself a little bit. As I said, my name is Shannon Earhart. I am a Khoikhan Athabascan. My family is originally from the village of Nalato. I'm a tribally enrolled member. I grew up here in the Fairbanks area. And my claim to fame basically besides working with our tribes is I grew up with a dog mushing. So I come from a dog mushing family in the state of Alaska. And it's not the long distance, it's sprint mushing. That's a whole other topic and a subject we could talk about another time. But as Diana mentioned, you guys are going to have a hard time seeing down there. But when the, we're through recording, Dixie is willing to answer questions. And we're going to invite you to come up and ask questions at the end. And you can come up and look up close if you'd like to for those of you in there. So. Um, that was a little bit about me, and as Diana said, we have two wonderful, beautiful artists. They've done this all their lives. They have artwork all across the United States and museums and everything else. And I'm very pleased and excited to have them here to share their experiences that we're going to talk about caribou hair tufting. And this episode is called Fluffy Creations, the Caribou Hair Tufting and explain it a little bit to us. So I'm gonna go ahead and pass it off to Dixie and ask her to introduce herself. Hello. <laughs> My name is Dixie Alexander. I come from Fort Yukon, Alaska, and in our language we call it Kuchaje, and it is the biggest Athabascan Kuchin village in the here in Alaska, and it's eight miles above the Arctic Circle, uh, 40, 142 miles from here. And it's eight miles above the Arctic Circle in my family. I grew up with six brothers and six sisters, lots of aunties, lots of cousins. And we all work together as a family when we were catching a lot of fish at fish camp. Our fish camp was located 40 miles above the village of Fort Yukon, right in the middle of this uh, circle city in Fort Yukon. Our fish camp was there and they call it Tent City because there were so many tents there. And a lot of people there cutting fish, working for the dogs to feed them in the wintertime when my dad went trapping. And we kept busy. I learned how to sharpen a fish cutting knife. And once you get good at that and didn't cut yourself, my mom would let you cut up a chum salmon. But we grew up at a, at a subsistent life, as a subsistent lifestyle with having so many kids and so much to do. We garden, we hunt caribou, pick berries, moose. Uh, kids would hunt for um, snare rabbits and hunt for spruce chickens and grouse and all kinds of stuff. And it was a fun lifetime to grow up that way, to learn how to be outside, to learn how to pack water and do all the amazing things. But in the wintertime, and we would also, at fish camp, we would use this time to tan the skins that need to be tanned outside. And uh, we would do that in between catching salmon and working at the fish camp. And uh, it was just a wonderful time, and I wouldn't trade that for the world growing up out in the woods like that. And um, so anyway, about myself. I moved here to Fairbanks. I was going to college at the University of Hilo in Hawaii, and um, my dad got sick, so I came back to Fairbanks, and I stayed with him until he passed. And um, that's how I came back to Fairbanks, and I live in North Pole. And I love teaching. The most funnest part about teaching is seeing that light in your eye when you just get it, and you try it and then you're happy and you don't want to stop until you finish what you're doing and then just moving on teaching and making people happy and the young girls would learn how to make earrings and the smaller stuff and then they grow up to be wonderful teachers just wonderful teachers like emma and so many other teachers now that are carrying on the porcupine quill work 
skin sewing, tufting, and doing beadwork. A lot of people are doing amazing things with weaving the beads. But I never got into knitting. My grandmother was the best knitter. She used to even make little tiny fingered knitting gloves with toothpicks for the zipper pulls of our parka. And I would watch her, and it even made me dizzy. <laughs> but I learned everything else that she had to, ta to teach us, all of us girls in the family, and all my aunties and my grandmother. And it was a wonderful way, traditional way to grow up. Thank you. Thank you, Dixie. So Emma, you want to give us a little introduce of yourself? Hi, everyone. My name is Emma Hildebrand. Um, my mother was Koyukon Athabaskan, and I'm the youngest of nine children. Uh, she gave me an Indian name. I was the only one of her kids. She called me Suguga, which means my baby. Um, my mother was born on the Kuskokwim River, and she was raised in a very traditional, strictly subsistence lifestyle. So she knew everything. Um, all the things Dixie talked about, you know, tanning hides and cutting fish, and she knew how to do, make snowshoes, and she taught my brothers how to build fish wheels and cabins, so she was a very all-around traditional, um, hands-on person. So I learned how to do um, the beadwork and the skin sewing from her, and did that until about 28 years ago. I run a nonprofit in the village of Northway where I was born and raised. Um, we brought Dixie down in 1994, and that's when I learned how to do the tufting and some of the quill cool work, and I was hooked. I wasn't very good at it, but um, in my spare time, that's what I did. I have a, also have a degree from the University of Alaska, a business degree, and from 1988 until 2005, I was president and CEO of my Anxa Village Corporation. So that took a lot of time, plus raising kids. But in, um, I think about 1995, I had a sister that worked for the university in one of the outlying villages, and she recruited me to come over and teach. So that started my career of passing on these traditions of beadwork, will work and caribou hair tufting. So I did that just sporadically over the years until 2005 when I gave up my daytime job. I moved to Anchorage and mainly concentrated on doing my crafts, which is my first love, and also teaching. I travel out to a lot of the outlying villages, teaching through the university or through other organizations that request my services. Um, I also teach uh, at the university off and on, the Cultural Center in Anchorage, and to many other organizations that uh, just want to help pass on these traditions. It's a good way to keep them alive. Um, I have four kids, um, three grandkids. Two of them are with me full time, so that takes some of my time. I don't have a whole lot of time for crafting anymore, but I still travel around teaching, um, do my artwork in the spare time that I have, and attend um, events like this when I'm requested, which I really enjoy. It's just so important to pass on the, these traditions, so teaching really gives me a really good feeling. And um, we learned it through being taught, so we're in turn doing our part in keeping these these traditions alive. I really appreciate you two sharing that. And with COVID, it's been really hard because we do a lot with, um, our organizations do a lot, working it with in-person types of things, trying to teach our young people. So we've been trying to temper, trying to do videos and stuff to keep these types of things alive. So it is really fun a way to try to do these and get you out to do that. So we appreciate that. So both of you have beautiful items up here on the table that some of them can't see, but we do have a camera, and like I said, you can have an opportunity to see them. But why don't we just kind of start off with the basics, and how do we get started with caribou hair tufting? What do you need to start a project? You want to go first, Dixie? Sure. <clears throat> well, traveling and going to Northway was always, um, it was when you have young kids at home, and but you have a 
a trusting family that would take care of them as good as you. It was wonderful to travel to many different villages to teach, and Northway was one of the funnest, and they're all fun to go to a new place and to meet new people and to meet what they do, and they actually show you things that you haven't done before. And going to Northway was a lot of fun. I don't know if you remember when um, I came down. I was about three, three or four trips. Two? Two? Okay, it was the second one I went down there. No, the first one. <laughs> Actually, you may have been there three times. You did dolls. Yeah, we did yeah. the dolls. And uh, But the first time I went there to do the tufting class, and um, we were cooking. We All of us, there was a lot of ladies there, maybe about 25 to 30, and they were all there waiting when I got there, and I pulled up, and... All the ladies brought in moose meat and smoked salmon and at the basket fry bread with blueberry jam and we were all preparing lunch so we could just eat what we wanted and then get back to our project because we were dyeing caribou hair. And the original caribou hair looks like this. I like to use it naturally when we're making pussy willows or uh, tufting with just the white hair. And then we dye it with different dyes. We could use, some people like to use natural dyes. A lot of people in our history, we heard about red dye. So we could also <coughs> use that, and some people use uh, cotton dyes, many different recipes. And caribou is hollow, has a hollow hair. The moose and caribou, you could use either or for the tufting. With the moose, it looks more like in antique colors when you do the dyeing of the hair. And we were dyeing at this workshop, dyeing caribou hair. And um, during lunch, and then it was lunchtime, and we had this amazing traditional food we were cooking. And in between sewing and dyeing, and all of a sudden it was lunchtime. All the ladies left. And I looked at him, aren't they going to stay for lunch? And she said, oh, it was cleanup week last week, or a couple of days before the workshop, and everybody was um, going back to the dump to get their caribou skins. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, really? And sure enough, they came right back with their hair in the back. And so you know what they were planning on since they learned how to do the dyeing of the caribou hair. And, um, and learning how to sew with it, and we already had enough hair to start the project as we're waiting for the dyes to set. And a lot of different recipes for the caribou hair. I use a little bit of vinegar to set the acid, to set the dyes, and then when you uh, put them in a container and dye them, they set there for until you take it out of the dyes and you wring it out. Of course, rubber gloves is good, especially when you're teaching and wring, it, wring them out, and if you like the color, then you would start the process of rinsing them. If you want the dyes to set longer and be more brilliant and have more color, um, then you would wait for a while. But it's, it's a, a fun project just to do the dyeing of the caribou hair and then actually working with the tufting. And, um, it's so much fun, and it gives it the beadwork. When you have your beadwork, and it's flat, it gives the beadwork um, more dimension. So I'm going to show you a project that I'm working on now, and it's going to be for a lady's coat. And it's all, it's just like a blanket of uh, beadwork, caribou hair tufting, and everything that grizzly bear eats. The blueberries, the salmon berries, the rose hips, and the, of course the salmon and the ground squirrels, which they love. And this is going to be on back of the coat. And I'm not, I didn't get into making animals. Usually we just do the floral and perennials from Alaska on the garments. But uh, about five, six years ago, I started doing animals, and I think the first funnest animal I did was the caribou with the antlers. And then this bear, um, I couldn't get the eyes to see straight. One was crooked and I had to take it out 
and put it back in, and I finally got them to look straight at me. <laughs> so that was a lot of fun. So Emma, what other type of materials do you use to, what do you need to start tufting with besides the dyed caribou hair? Um, she said caribou hair is hollow. That allows you to cinch it together in a really tight stitch and it, it doesn't come out if you tie it on there tight enough. Um, otherwise, it wouldn't work. Um, besides caribou hair, she mentioned moose hair. Moose hair is hollow. I've found that moose hair is um, pretty um, coarse. coarse, so it's really difficult to tuft. It's really a strong hair. Uh, also, um, deer hair can be tufted, and you can buy deer hair in a sporting goods store. They use it for tying fishing flies, and it's usually dyed in some pretty vibrant colors. And recently I found that doll sheep hair works really good for tufting too, and there's a lot of white hair on a doll sheep, so the lighter colors of um, the colored hair come out better using white hair. Um, a lot of the caribou and the deer are kind of a darker hair, which works really good getting the darker colors, but pink, yellow, orange come out better with white hair, which normally a caribou doesn't have a lot of um, just around the, the edges. Um, if you're going to um, dye the hair, the hide can be just a raw hide with all of the flesh and the membrane taken off the back, or it can be a dyed hide, or a, a tanned hide, sorry. I've actually bought reindeer hide online and used that because sometimes it's hard to get a caribou hide, and it takes quite a bit of time to, to clean the back of a hide. And then when you go to actually use the hair, it, you cut it off of the hide. It's not left on there. You cut, cut off a chunk, and it's fed into a, a stitch which is tied really tightly. Normally we use a nylon cord, we call it imitation sinew, and it, a stitch is actually made on top of whatever material you're using. It can be done on any type of tanned skin, leather, um, fabric, velvet. Um, I've even seen tufting on birch bark. So. Um, a three-cornered needle is used. Um, can't use a bead needle because you wouldn't be able to pull the cord through. And then a stitch is made, a loop is left, and then a chunk of hair is fed into that loop. And yeah. how big is that chunk? Depending on how big you want the tuft. So the more hair, the larger tuft. So we just hold it so, feed it through the loop, and pull it. If you have to adjust it to make sure you get closer to the edge that's cut off of the hide, and then you just pull it really hard and it stands up like troll hair. <laughs> <laughs> troll hair. Remember the sure. troll dolls from the, the yeah. 60s? <laughs> and then you have to get a really good knot tied on the back. You don't want that hair slipping out after you do all of the work of trimming it down. And once you get it tied on there, then a really nice pair of fine pointed scissors um, for cutting the hair. That tying it on there is probably takes some practice because um, you've got to have some tough hands to pull that without losing the tension on the hair once you get that knot on there. And then most of the time is um, trimming each, each of those tufts into a shape. So is that the practice then? Is Just practice, practice, yep. For and <clears throat> the beauty of it is if you mess it up, you just cut it off and tie another one. So if you keep <laughs> messing up, you get more practice and <clears throat> you'll the hair, when you cut it off, is pretty staticky, so if you're going to do it in the house, you want to have a nice lint roller next to you or a nice little shop vac. I actually like to sit on the porch and just let the wind the extra hair when you're trimming it off because it'll stick to all your clothes, you'll find it in your food. <laughs> is your gauge. Um, I sew with my right hand. 
So when you're tufting, <clears throat> this is your gauge. So the first cut is always the first one to get perfect. And once you start getting that hang of your gauge, getting the hair, and then working on petals, it gives you a chance to make all the petals. And I usually don't trim them down until I get all the five petals to a wild rose like this. I do all of the petals first. So that way when you trim, you could make them more even to each other. And then when we start to plan, I mark the skin. I do the center first and then I mark the petals where I want that to go. That gives me a gauge to where that they'll even when you when you're done with doing the florals like this. And the flowers, you could put more than one color into your loop. And you could clip off two or three colors and this is three colors in this flower here. And then that's just making your gauge. You put them right on top of each other in a pile and feel your gauge and takes them out if it's too thick because you don't want one petal to be fatter than the other. And um, the knots have to be all big knots so that when you're pulling on it on the back of your project, when you're pulling on it with your thread, if your knot moves, that means you will have to get your needle under that gauge and tie another knot under it. So you're just tying maybe four or five knots until your knot doesn't move. <clears throat> that means your tufting won't come out. And many times I've put them through the washer too on my apron. <laughs> so tufting is pretty much, is it a universal style? I mean, or is there other ways to do it? Or is it that basic loop style always? This is the traditional, uh, the first workshop we ever did was in the village of Fort Yukon where I was born. And uh, it was a grant from CATG, Council of Athabascan Tribal Government. They have a new name now. And they got a grant to in the springtime when school was still in session. Um, they sent for me to come interview the elders. And they wanted the workshop to be two weeks. So I couldn't teach 13, 14 hours a day for, uh, so I, I asked him, well, am I gonna be able to hire other master artists? And they said, sure, we can't have you running around 17 hours a day. And um, we got together and I flew over to Fort Yukon and interviewed the elders. And they made good money from their sewing. They buy stuff for their grandkids. They buy all the stuff they need where they need to spend their money. And they make good money sitting at home and everything is perfectly placed. Their quill work is all over here. Their beads are all hanging here and just all organized. They could come out in their slippers in the middle of the night when they can't sleep just to sit down and work on their project. And a couple of the ladies that I interviewed uh, very famous ladies and uh, I wanted them to teach and to do different projects every other day so that we're not going to pick a really big project for that's all you're doing. You want to do many different projects and if you don't get it done you take those pieces home and we provided all kinds of supplies for them to take home so they could in turn teach their grandkids the artwork. <coughs> but the First question I came on to was a couple of the ladies said, well, I make good money staying at home. Why would I want, want to go to a <coughs> workshop when I already know how to do everything? <laughs> and I was like, oh, well, I tell you what, you come to the first two days. If you come and you don't learn anything from us, then you can just stay home and I will understand. But if you fall in love and we try something new, something different, something that we've never done before, would you stay? Oh yeah, they said we would stay. So uh, the first day we did dyeing of the porcupine quills, many different jugs. And this is why I like to do teaches because the students get to help you. 
dirty their hands, dyeing porcupine quills, caribou hair, doing all this work. And, uh, and then after we set the all dyes, were all set, we sat down and we had set up uh, all the tables with jars of porcupine quills soaking in them because when you sew with the porcupine quill, you have to make them nice and soft in the water for a few minutes. And then we flattened it. We tried to not chew it because we want to keep our teeth. So we flattened them with the back of a scissor, make them nice and flat and then sew with them when they're wet because they won't crack when you fold them back and forth. And you hide your stitches under that quill. Can you hold up that one while she's and, uh, here? Yeah, just, she, well, I meant for them in the crowd. This one just shows the porcupine quills that Dixie's kind of talking about, so you know what Dixie's talking about. And there's this way, too. This is what my mom gave me for my birthday. And it's all made with a size 10 and 11 glass beads with dyed porcupine quill and uh, caribou skin on the back. And there's many different ways and styles to sew with the porcupine quills. <clears throat> but tufting, so is it another type of technique or is it all the same pulling the loop? Yeah, it's all the same. So you could mix the colors and um, I think it brings a lot of dimension to just the glass beads. Uh, before we were introduced to, in the mid-1800s, before we were introduced to the glass beads by means of missionaries, gold miners, fur buyers that traveled up and down the Yukon, introduced us to lots of different material, like black velvet, canvas, beads, threads, needles. And before that, we would sew with dyed porcupine quills, natural dyes, and glass beads, and the porcupine quills, and silverberry seeds things we would get from the forest. We would save all the bones from the birds we eat and make bone beads out of their little legs and make use of the whole animal. And we did that with every animal that we harvested. And how about Emma? Do you have any of your favorite memories or any favorite projects you like to share with how you? I just wanted to, um hit on your point of other ways of tufting. I actually saw um, one of my brother-in-laws had traveled over into Siberia and came back with a wall hanging that was a 3D um, picture of scenery and animals that had been done right on the reindeer hide. So they had stretched it out and then trimmed it down. It was very intricate like her, her bear here. So that's the only other technique that I've seen done. Um, she was talking about the porcupine quills, which I think is my favorite thing to to cr create with. Um, I love the fact that it's a very traditional uh, material, and uh, you can just do so many things with it. I actually attended a quill work symposium at the university or the museum in Anchorage about 11 years ago where a quill expert from the lower 48 was brought up. So we learned all of the techniques that the indigenous Americans use, plus um, the Dena'ina Indians and the Athabascan Indians here in the state also did. And some of those techniques I had never seen before, so it was really an exciting week for me. And I've gone on to teach all of those quill techniques too, and, and I use a lot of them in most of the uh, items that I've made probably over the last 10 years, um, lots of quills, thousands of quills, and uh, a kind of a funny story. Um, sometimes quills are hard to get. Um, people still eat porcupine. Um, certain times of the year are when they're harvested, but you need porcupines all the time, porcupine quills especially if you're teaching. It takes a lot of quills um, to teach just one class, which I usually have up to 24 students. So uh, when I can't get quills from maybe one of my sisters who's out um, getting porcupine to eat, I've ordered them online. And when I can't get them online, if I see a porcupine that's been run over on the highway, I'll jump out and grab the carcass and take it home. Well, I've found since I moved to Anchorage it's tough to get rid of that carcass once you've pulled out the quills that you want. <laughs> so now I just pull it off to the side and 
pull out the quills I need and then just leave it there. So I was doing a um, demonstration like this at the museum a few years ago and talking about the fact that I get quills from roadkill. And it was filmed like this. It was like a half a day. Um, I think you might have been there with me, me and you at that symposium at the museum. Yes. Anyway, the news people were there half a day filming us and we're doing all these beautiful demonstrations of all these quill techniques that we learned and they said, yeah, you'll be on the news tonight. So I'd call everybody I know and rush home to sit down and watch the news and the only thing that they had on there was me talking about pulling quills out of roadkill. <laughs> <laughs> and then I did the same thing two years ago they were there for several hours filming, and wouldn't you know, the only thing they put on there was me talking about pulling quills at a roadkill. So I try to avoid that story now <laughs> because there's so much more to quill work than just picking up roadkill. Salvaging roadkill. And growing up as a kid, yeah, we'd stop by roadkill. <clears throat> I have the same story. My cousin needs porcupine quills, we gotta stop. What do we have? Cardboard? Oh, give me that sweatshirt and we're over there trying to salvage porcupine quills. So, um, no, that's, that's an awesome story. But their work is beautiful. I mean, Dixie's had pieces in the Smithsonian Museum. Emma's got work all over the state of Alaska and probably more places. And you will get to see this up close, all her different techniques. But um, that was your favorite story. And you've talked about how we've gotten the quills. And you mentioned it, you touched on it earlier about how you got caribou hair tufting. But is there usually a better time of the year? I mean, we're only allowed usually to kill caribou in August during hunting season. But do you notice, have you ever noticed, is there a better time if it's a winter kill or Defi fall kill? Definitely. And I didn't know that until recently. Um, people have given me hides over the last few years. And I've been showing um, some of my buddies how to flesh them and, and dye them. So someone gave me a couple hides um, back last year and they've been in my freezer all this time. So I thought, well, we'll dig them out and, and start working with them. Well, the hair was so short on them. I didn't even think you could barely trim it off with a pair of scissors. So um, the winter hides is what, what you would need for the, the thicker, coarser mm -hmm. hair. Good to know. So this People that are caribou hunting right now in August, it's not a good time, huh? <laughs> not a good time to salvage but hides if, for But if you're hungry in the winter yeah. <laughs> and you need the meat, then you've got mm -hmm. you're all these brothers and hunt. sisters. And, <laughs> and those, those are thinner hides, so those would be kept to use for tanning That's to, true. You know, to that do the work true. on. Very true. So we talked about knowledge. You guys have both been teaching it. Um, are your own kids learning? Either one of you want to take that? Yeah. My daughter, Rita, Rita Jewel Pitka, started sewing when she was about six years old. And I, I took a break, went to the restroom, and came back. And she had a big tear in her eye. And she said, I poked myself with the needle. And I said, take a break. Come back. It'll still be there. And she says, no, I'm going to get this needle. I'm going to thread this needle, even if it takes me all day. <laughs> and when she graduated high school, um, she worked with me for a year. I had a studio here in Fairbanks when I was working on the Doyen Limited building and working with Morris Thompson, um, designing that building. And uh, she wanted to make her own garment. So I got the moose skin, I got the caribou hair, I got the porcupine quills. I also have lots of caribou hair for you. And anyway, she sat with me for a year in our studio, and I taught her how to do this all at the Baskin with only Alaskan perennial flowers like the fireweed, the bluebells, the rose hips, and the wild roses, and the dwarf dogwood, and on and on, all these. I cut out everything. I showed her how to make her pattern, her size. And she worked on it for a whole year. And she entered World Indian Eskimo Olympics. 
and she finished, took her a year to put it all together, and I helped her. I helped her design. I helped her do the drawings. I helped her do the quill work, and she kept going on and coming every day, and she entered the World Indian Eskimo Olympics dress competition for Athabascan Indian garments, Indian dress, and she ran against my sister-in-law, my brother's wife, and my mother. Oh, <laughs> and she came in first. And then oh. she entered an, a gar another piece that I made, and she helped me make it for the riverboat. And it's still down at the riverboat. That piece was down there 35 years until they ordered another one. Now they have a brand new one, and the old piece could be rested on a mannequin right now. Oh. And she entered that one and ran against my sister-in-law and also my mother again with some fur pieces that they have. But she took first place in that piece too. And there she was, all dressed up in this, I must have weighed about 18 to 20 pounds with the slippers, the belt, everything. And then she won both pieces, so she had to put that parka <laughs> over her dress and go up to accept her first place award and all the cousins and nephews were telling me my mom's gonna beat you <laughs> I says it's Rita running <laughs> and anyways she made me so proud and she did such an amazing job and she still sews today and she's working with glass doctor out in North Pole and they want her to take over the business the owner wants to retire awesome so uh, she still sews today, and she still helps me on my commissions, and she makes what teaching is all about. Just brings out the beauty of what your hands could do. How about you, Emma? Anybody in your family continuing on? I taught both of my girls how to do beadwork, cool work, tufting, and my oldest daughter, Tiffany, um, just picked it up real quick. You couldn't even tell the difference between hers and mine. She was an expert from the start. Um, my younger daughter, not really a beater, she did it for a little while and then quit. But my oldest son, who's 27 now, um, really crafty with his hands, um, really good at drawing and stuff. So he would travel around with me um, to some of the classes I taught. And he was only two when he asked if he could cut caribou hair. So I would tie it on for him and give him the scissors. and. He'd sit there, and I think the first two, he just kept cutting until, poof, he had gone down to the thread, and <laughs> everything just came off. But he got the hang of it, and over the years made a few little projects. And then I think he was about nine when he wanted a Nintendo console. So I had him do a bunch of earrings and a little bit of tufting, and took him to AFN, and he made enough for his... Nintendo console, and he never sewed a day after. <laughs> <laughs> um, my grandkids, they like to do stuff too. My granddaughter's done a little bit of tufting and um, hasn't shown a lot of interest in it. But uh, about a month ago, I had him helping me with the caribou hair, dyeing it and rinsing it. And they really got into that. And it was a lot of fun having them help me. So, I mean, leading away, you both are teaching classes, so we're continuing it to help other youth get involved. But are there recommendations for people out there, you know, how to, if they are, have an interest, what's the best way to start? Don't start on some, don't get a big project like that bear, or what's a good way to start, or even to get youth involved if we want to continue it, or what, what's your recommendations? Do berries. All kinds of berries here in Alaska. Salmon berries are orange, blueberries are brilliant and taste really good. And it's so easy to do the berries because it's one tuft, just like this tuft that she did, or, or I did, on this piece and this piece. The berries are so, it's a beginner project. The berries are just wonderful. So they don't this have is, to match. And they don't have to match. They could be different sizes and the scissors you buy are, I like the Fisker scissors, but there's many different scissors. I even collect scissors and use them in the teaching on many different things. On the tufting, I would do small pieces. Like you could do one tuft for a pair of earrings, moose skin, 
is probably the most expensive hide you'll ever spend money on, but it's well worth it because whatever you make on moose skin, it's going to last a long time, and it's going to be worth the gift that people make. If you've ever tied a pom-pom and trimmed it down, you've tufted. Yeah. Oh, with yarn. With okay. yarn. Yeah. Same thing. So you said one other question somebody had put down the paper asked me, I, and I don't know, I don't think I've ever heard this. Is there, have either of you ever heard, is there a cultural significance to the caribou tufting? Or is it just a technique that has been passed on? It's a technique, and when I was doing the um, interview and all the elders about uh, coming to work, and they did come, and they did fall in love with the caribou hair tufting and the porcupine quill. The porcupine quill technique has been traditional because the native people loved to eat the porcupine quill, especially if you were sick. Um, they make juice out of them, boil the meat until they make nice broth. If you had stomach ailments or anything like that, you would just sip on the broth. The tail was always, people would fight over the tail. They'd fry it up until it puffs up and gets nice and crunchy. And the porcupine lives on the spruce trees. In our culture, the spruce trees have a lot of medicine on it. We use the pitch from the spruce trees to get out a cut that's been um, infected. Um, the porcupine lives on the spruce trees and eats on the spruce trees. And when they carry their young, they're hiding inside their quails. So um, a lot of the road kills are the good way to save the quails. We don't eat the road kills because we don't know how long it's been there, but we still can harvest the quills to use them for a good cause. Dixie mentioned how the indigenous people used everything they could from the animals. Um, it showed a lot of respect to the animal, but it, um, you know, when you don't really have much else, you make use of what you get. So besides the food part, um, making clothing out of items and native people did everything with their hands so you get somebody with some really creative ideas in their head and they're going to come up with a use for everything i mean who'd have thought you could make such beautiful things out of those things porcupines are carrying around um, they use the bones to make tools and then thought oh well that's going to make a beautiful bead or a necklace and the same with the hair. Um, I'm sure somebody thought, hmm, look what we can do with the quill. What can we do with this caribou hair? You know, people, people that are very artistic get some pretty unique ideas in their head. So it, it's really cool. You know, nothing of the animal was ever thrown away. It was put to good use. Fun fact, the caribou hair, moose hair, was also used for insulation for warmth because of the hollowness it would hold the heat. So. That was another use that we traditionally that was used for to line our boots and mittens. So, yep. okay. So we still got a few minutes here. Does anybody have any wrap up? Anything you want to closing comments or things you want to share? Uh, the elders in Fort Yukon, when I was doing the interviews of who wanted to come, we had all kinds of different artists. We had almost fourteen different artists from many different places but from the interior because the grant that we got from CATG was to have two students from east, each school all around our area Fort Yukon, Birch Creek, Minakai, Minakai, Chalkeetsik, uh, Arctic Village. Yeah. They would come with a chaperone so we didn't have to worry about other people's kids but we could teach them and feed them good and they had a great time. They were taking back gifts on what they learned their two weeks in Fort Yukon. And um, it was just an amazing time to do the research on the caribou hair tufting. I read so, so many books and trying to figure out how could I get these elders to bring their cookie cans to our workshop and share their patterns and their knowledge and their stories. And oh my gosh, they were staying up till two in the morning sewing. And when we get there at nine, taking breaks to eat breakfast or lunch and whatnot and doing all the other things. Um, it was, it was uh, wonderful to 
put together all the teachers. There were teachers, famous teachers like um, my really good friend, Denise Hardesty. She's the one that invented how to do the sun catchers. We don't make dream catchers up here. We make sun catchers so we could catch a little bit of the sun in the wintertime here. And she did that by using her grandmother's scrap beads and really got interested in doing beadwork. And she had all, and a long time ago, when her mother was young, they were really into the colors of the sun, like orange, red, and yellow. So she started with those beads. And she would lose a pair of earrings and she wanted to, you didn't want to get rid of them or couldn't find them and didn't want to make them again. She would tie them on to the tips of the, the danglies that you would do on sun catchers. And we read every magazine and everything and there was this one article and in, it was in a magazine of the tufting that was done in Canada, the caribou hair tufting. And not the caribou, the moose hair, they did moose hair tufting and they also made the, the uh, scenic, it's like using paint but you use hair to make uh, beautiful pictures of animals and flowers. So we went from there, Denise and I. And I said, I know how to do the dyeing, I'll do the dyeing. And then after everything is dry, we'll have, we'll have them do the dyeing and they could take those hairs and those pork pine quills home so they'd have a, a kit to show somebody else and to teach somebody else. So that was how the caribou hair tufting started in Fort Yukon. And now everybody's doing it everywhere. In Wales, I went to Wales to teach, that was awesome. It was like 22 miles away from Russia and on a clear day you could see it. <laughs> and uh, they, they had salmon berries. Their mountains were all orange, just wow. filled with salmon berries. And I was working with Mary Shields at the Riverboat Discovery. I worked down there for 20 years in beautiful place, beautiful village right on the Tanana and Chena River. And, um, and, uh, and anyways, um, the the caribou here traveled all over from me teaching other teachers like this wonderful lady here and many other teachers but there was a lot of famous ladies that went to the workshop in Fort Yukon. There was Dolores Sloan, Catherine Peter, Selena Alexander, Denise Hardesty and um, there was several other people from Arctic Village and Venatai and Chalkitsik and Beaver, the village of Beaver. And uh, lots of people came to our workshop and stayed up from nine o'clock in the morning till wee hours in the night. And it was so exciting to see, there was a table at Chief Zai's Lula's Fort in Fort Yukon. It's not there no more, but there was a t table, a wooden table that was man-made, about 20 feet long, about eight feet wide, so we could put stuff in the middle, and we had everything there that you wanted, we wanted <laughs> to give them, and they had everything laid out, and it was just a beautiful time to, and the right time to do those teachings that went all over the state of Alaska. That's right. Thank you, Dixie. How about you, Emma? Do you have anything you want to, final words you want to say before we go? <clears throat> I have found um, recently, and I, it's kind of something that I've noticed, you know, with everything going on in the world, um, COVID, and um, you need something that kind of takes off some of the edge. And um, with some things that I've gone through in my life in the last few years, I've found that my beating, co-work, and my tufting are a great therapy. Um, it just relaxes your mind and gives your hands something to do and you get to make something really nice in the process. <coughs> and in some of the travels that I've done, I've heard other individuals say the same thing. It's a great way to um, help yourself get through some, you know, times of grief and stress. Awesome. It's good therapy. Yeah. Then you don't even have to talk. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, I want to thank you, too. This is going to be the end of our recorded show. So now we're going to allow you live audience to ask questions, and I think you could come up and look. <laughs> so thank you.